Well, I'll be talking about Anyway, a pathway to healthy societies. And I have taken mitochondrial perspective as a biologist, which I'll come to in a due course of time. What I have put over there, you all would agree with me that the fast pace of economic development has not made us immune to disease burden. And this disease burden has been rising. Along with this disease burden has been the stress level which has been arising. And then what has happened? We ask a question to ourselves, why is it due to? What have we done to ourselves that this disease burden keeps on rising? In India, the cancer rate wasn't as high as it is today as compared to Western Europe. Today, it's matching with that particular rate. And what have we done? We have acted as our own enemies. How we have acted as our own enemies? In the process of evolution, what has happened, the evolution equipped us in our genomic material, the blueprint all of us have. It equipped us with variations in our genome which were favorable to sustenance, survival, withstanding diseases, and yet, with all this bestowed upon us by nature, we abused it. And we abused it to the extent that today we are suffering. And I'll give you a glimpse of that. So how have we... Well, all of us in this audience have 100 trillion cells in our body. Can I go back? All of, this, all of us in this audience have 100 trillion cells in our body. And in these 100 trillion cells, we have two kinds of genomic materials. One is there in the nucleus, which is contributed by our parents. And in case of males, obviously, father contributes Y chromosome. So it's father to son transmission. And the mother contributes mitochondria to both daughters and sons. Mother does not discriminate. Fathers do. So mother is always fair. So daughters and sons both get mitochondria. That's why I have picked up this mitochondrial perspective and how it operates. And what I have shown over here, for engineering students, it's like a factory. The whole body is like a factory with number of machines operational over there. So to a mechanical engineer, I would say, well, you use machine language to understand this. And a mathematician along with this mechanical engineering student would be saying, well, let me use nonlinear mathematics to understand it. So you put together nonlinear mathematics with machine language and you understand it. Well, somebody in the electronics would say, sir, what do I do in this situation? I'll say, well, think about grids and how the transmission takes place. So there's communication of information from one grid to another grid. And computer engineer says, well, you didn't talk about me. I'll say, don't worry. Talk about hubs and edges in those hubs and how the communication is transmitted through these hubs. That's how biology has to be understood today by you youngsters in future, understanding the complex systems. So we try to understand this complex system as a whole and what all goes on over there in terms of biochemical reactions, in terms of synthesis which is going on in terms of information transfer from cell to cell, from generation to generation. That's what we deal with. I'm not good at this. Give me the other one. Why is I'm sorry for this. So there are two levels at which we understand genomics. One level is that at the genome level, which I said is being contributed by both parents. And the other level is of some modifications which are happening in the genome. And these modifications are called methylations. So you have in the double standard DNA like this, 
you have bases over there, these are letters. So all of us have a three billion letter long DNA coming from mother and three billion letter long DNA coming from father. And there are these four alphabets in the DNA, four nucleotides, and they are the ones which determine the language of DNA. And they are organized in a man manner along the length of this three billion letter long DNA that you create landscaping features in the genome. And all is about those landscaping features, like you have natural landscape outside, you have diverse elements over there, you can't overlap them with each other, they have their own distinct identities. Similarly, in the genome also, these four bases organized in a randomized manner, they create their own landscaping features, and scientists have given some names to them. Microsatellites, mini-satellites, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, you don't have to bother about that. You just remember, like a natural landscaping features, you have features over there. Now, this word cytosine, this label, gets modified. And all this modification happens randomly, but it also can be, this is called epigenetic regulation. This can also happen, this methylation, one of the epigenetic regulators, it can also happen by dietary habits, bad dietary habits, irregular dietary habits, or exposure to chemicals, carcinogens, mutagens. So it can happen by all this. That's what is why cancer rate is increasing today. So there is a regulation at our blueprint level, the DNA. One regulation is genomic structural. So there are some changes happening over there. And another level of regulation is epigenetic. And I'll just use these words maybe in between so you need to understand them. This is what we are doing. So our poor lifestyle, we have also the sedentary kind of lifestyle. We have syndrome of plenty and high stress. And this, it's like rich and poor, both are suffering. So you have plenty in one case and you have stress in another case to become rich. And there is this unbalanced ecosystem. This ecosystem not only outside which influences us, but also inside us. What does it result into? So we asked a question as a researcher we asked a question, it's too complex. Because you can have different levels at the genome level. Three billion letter long DNA may have hundreds and thousands of changes happening over there, which we call mutations. And then you can't be looking at a drug for each one of them. Then on top of that, you can have epigenetic kind of modulations these, because of these methylations and other, other levels of modifications which can happen, which are epigenetic in character then you can't be looking for drugs for each one of them. So is there a possi possibility that it, does it converge at some metabolic, at some biochemical level? If this convergence can happen over there, then you can target this with a particular drug. That's the story I'm going to give you. That quickly, how this convergence in a normal cell when we eat and the carbohydrates break down, they generate sugar and the sugar is processed by a biochemical machinery. And this mitochondria plays a good role over there in balancing itself with the nuclear material and the biochemical reactions which are going on here, which are glyco, glyc, you know, glycolysis over here, which is happening. I want, don't want to use these complex words for you. And this pyruvate enters in the mitochondria, and the mitochondria is the hub for creating power, creating energy, and you can see here 36 ATP molecules being generated. Whereas in cancer situation, you have this happening, glycolysis happening, processing of glucose taking place, some biochemical reactions going on, yet you do not have adequate energy being generated over there. It does not require that. It's an abnormal situation which is happening over there, and the energy generated is through this process and the cell gets geared towards this biosynthesis of nucleotides. So what is happening basically, the cell is geared to produce energy through this process of using sugars, whatever food we eat. So all the glucose which is generated over there, the cell uses it very quickly. And when cell uses it very quickly, it generates a phenomenon which is called Warburg's hypothesis. So Warburg had suggested that more of glucose will be taken by the cancer cell, 
and more of lactate will be produced. This is kind of a feature of a cancer cell. Now, mitochondria comes into picture because mitochondria works. This tiny molecule within the cell has its own genome. As I said, mother passes on to both daughters and sons. And it maintains this balance, the homeostasis. We, in technical term, would call homeostasis, but I will use balance as the word. So it balances over there. It, the homeostasis is that mitochondria will replicate, divide. We call it biogenesis. And then it will see, see to it that the cell is restored back. It survives. Because survival is one of the features of the cell to sustain itself for future. And all those reactions are going there. Information transfer is there. And this mitochondria, you will be surprised to know, is an outsider in billions of years which has come inside the cell. And we allowed, at that time, the cell allowed it to sustain itself, to live there peacefully. And it lived peacefully all these millions and millions of years in the cell that in humans also you have this mitochondria. And they are the powerhouse, they are energy producers. They also synthesize. They also signal. So there's a communication between this tiny organelle within the cell, communication between mitochondria and the nucleus, and the nucleus and the mitochondria. So this communication, this balance, is maintaining the homeostasis in the cell. And this homeostasis in the cell obviously make homeostasis in the body, the physiological homeostasis. If this is disturbed, as would happen in cancer cases, so mitochondria plays an important role in maintaining this balance. And as an outsider, I would say mitochondria has taken us for a ride. Because now it came as an outsider, lived all through the evolution, and has taken control of it. So today people are thinking that if I put good mitochondria in a bad cell, is it going to recover? Yes, it happens that despite the bad genomic background, the epigenomic background, if you put good mitochondria over there, it's so important, it communicates so well, it tries to maintain the homeostatic balance in the cell, and cell has some normalcy restored back. But sometimes, like in cancer situation, it feels helpless under abnormal conditions. So this is how mitochondria feels. It has a balance between life and death in the cell. So it undergoes survival. And at the same time, it has, it leads to the death, which is called, in technical terms, it's, we say apoptosis. So mitochondrial behavior, if abnormal, can lead to cell death. And obviously, if cell does not die and has a baggage of damaged DNA inside it, and it survives, and the immune response which we have cannot fight it out, cannot kill these cells. So what would happen? Cancer arises. So mitochondria definitely is, is a very important organ, though it came as an outsider in the cell. So it, it's at the crossroads of the life and death, and it plays an important role. And what are we doing with this? The mitochondrial DNA mutations, the mitochondrial methylations, as I mentioned and introduced to you, that the two levels of regulations which happen at the genome level, one is the structural part. There will be changes in this genome, which may accumulate over the evolution, which were good for us. Evolution gave rise to them and asked us to, well, these are good changes in you. You survive, you, and we abuse them. Today, those changes have failed us. Those changes have acted against us. The changes which we acquired in the evolution, which were good for us by our bad habits and lifestyles, these very changes, which we call polymorphisms in promoters, they have started behaving, which were favorable in evolution. They have started behaving erratically, and that has created an abnormal situation. And in mitochondria, again, the mutations which happen, that means genetic changes, and the methylation which happens, which is epigenetic changes. We did not know much about the epigenetic changes in mitochondria. In fact, this was proposed long, long ago. We were the, one of those first ones who have established it, that, well, mitochondrial methylation takes place. 
and this mitochondrial methylation which is happening in the mitochondrial genome retains the homeostasis of a cell by increasing its mass which is called biogenesis by increasing its mitochondrial potential which is very important and when I use the word like potential and uh, mass definitely it should you know, tingle a bell in your head and you should say well there's something going on this complex structure and this complex structure need to be understood in non-linear with some kind of a language which is very different and that's machine language so because it's not so simple what does it do I'll just highlight some mechanism over here not going in scientific details if by these habits right from sedentary lifestyle to irregular dietary habits and I have given you this background that the genomic background which was favorable in evolution for us has turned bad now and on top of that you have now mutations introduced in cancer only a few days back again it was published that what was bad luck what was called it's bad luck if somebody is suffering from cancer has mutations yeah. now they say well it's randomized so most of the mutations which are happening in cancer in the cells are happening in the tumor and they don't have the presence their presence in normal cells that means out of 500 odd genes there are 500 which are somatic mutations and only few of them are germline which are passing from generation to generation which means that we are abusing our system in such a way that these mutations are getting introduced and they may take a shape where they are turning into a cancerous cell or a tumorogenic cell now here is a situation that the mitochondria how it behaves and how it regulates it generates these free radicals whatever food we eat we generate free radicals and these free radicals in our body we have a system which will scavenge it which will mop it and if the machinery of ours of the mopping machinery is not good then obviously these free radicals are going to be accumulated over there they have a very short half-life or that they don't sustain there for too long but then within that period they are able to damage DNA they're able to damage mito other things lipids carbohydrates in the body now all this system abusing system through insulin signaling and other signalings they make this metabolism turn into one of the enzymes which we have researched on which is called pyruvate kinase one of the isozymic forms which is a tetramer this tetramer four molecules always become stable dimers and this stable dimer turns in the cell into anabolic state and uh, I'll just give you a glimpse over here. The mitochondria, even one base change, just one base change, generates the oxygen species or these free radicals. They go inside the nucleus, they signal, and then signaling is this methylation happening. This methylation in the nuclear genes makes anti-apoptotic, which means survival genes. They give the signal for survival. That goes very high. This gives signal in the metabolism. The dimers are high as compared to normal enzyme tetramer. In the pathway, the biochemical pathway, you will have more towards the PPP shunt, and that maintains the anabolic character. Anabolic character is required for the cancer cell to sustain itself. And uh, it does not happen only in mitochondrial situation. Even the pathway in the nuclear genes, whether apoptosis is there or immune response, they fail or DNA damage fails, then, or epigenomic signal fails, they generate the same phenomenon of pyruvate kinase dimerization. We have looked into that. Now, finally, we have looked into how do we tackle with this? So we have tried to have signatures of metabolism. Now, these are groups where highly vascularized tissue is, the tumor tissue is there, or cells are there. There are poorly vascularized cells. There are some which will make metastasis that means they will spread in the body or they will be chemo resistant for drugs for all these we have generated certain metabolic features signatures and we are attacking these signatures through these molecules which are molecules from within making inhibitors for them and they have worked they killed the cancer cell and that's what in the society is going to be beneficial in future and i hope it takes that practical shape of transforming itself in terms of certain drugs which are simple which are cheap because they're based on very cheap methodology ultimately. Or genomic, epigenomic events are converging on that event in the metabolism. And if you target that metabolism for cancer cell, the cancer cell is going to die, and all these forms of cancer are going to be contained. Thank you very much.